Okay, thanks guys. Uh, I'm, so, hi, I'm Josh Surrett. Uh, I'm the guy who uses a Linux laptop and can't present on his own laptop randomly. I think this is the second time it's happened to me at any Scala. So, what? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Anyway, so, I don't know if you remember last year, I think I was the last one to give a talk and I went way over time. Way over time, by like 30 minutes. So, I promise you, that this one will be much shorter because most of it was meant to be live coding. <coughs> All right, anyway, no, not, that, that's a lie. Okay, we're gonna talk about selfish UIs. And we're gonna start with the demo, which is no longer happening, uh, but it's fine, it's fine. I'll tell you what happened, we can visualize, okay? Um, then we're gonna talk about like, how to implement your own UIs. But first, a little bit of motivation, all right? So, all the time we're developing software to try to make somebody else's lives easier. All the time, all the time. How often do you focus on your own daily life and try to make your own life a little bit easier so that you can develop software faster? A lot of times there's little tiny command line tools that you can make for some task you do repeatedly that will improve your ability to deliver code. The person who taught me this I think is still here. His name is Paul Phillips, I don't know where he is. But if you ever have a chance to watch this, <laughs> this man work, it's amazing. Uh, the amount of productivity tools he's built around his dev process is, is exciting, and uh, it really can improve your, your uh, throughput of what you can build. Um, but anyway, it's actually relatively easy to make these things, and if you make something that's reusable for other people, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> the demo, you can imagine, I have a terminal open, and I type snark check, and it shows my Twitter stream in color. That's, that's what the demo is. And you can also run tweets and that sort of thing. It's just a, a little command line terminal client that I made to show you like examples of what this is. But we're gonna talk about how this, how this guy is implemented and works. So, <coughs> the architecture of snark check. You pass a command line string in, okay? Do the thing I want. This comes into a parser, you lift that into a command, you pass in your configuration context and you execute it. Does this sound familiar to anyone who watched uh, Runar's talk? Yeah, okay, good. Because that's, that's basically all we're doing in command lines, and we're doing it very small, very quick, very efficiently. Um, but uh, because I was lazy, we don't necessarily use functional programming. No, anyway. Um, okay, but our technology choices right now, just uh, because I implemented this in about 30 minutes, was SPT completion, which is what we'll talk about. This is how you can do command line parsing and tab completion. Um, and without the demo, it doesn't look as nice, but this is what's used under the covers for SBT. Uh, if you've seen SBT on the command line, when you press tab, it'll tell you what tasks are available, and that's dynamically created. Um, the SBT completion parser library is how that happens. Um, <coughs> for the fancy color schemes, if you want to color content, you get that right out of the standard library of Scala. There's this thing called scala.console that has nice, nice, uh, immutable values called red and <laughs> green. <laughs> the most important one is reset because after you make something red, if you want to ever read anything ever again, you need to reset the terminal. Um, and then for rich interaction is JLine, but I kind of cut a lot of that out of the talk because JLine is not a 15 minute talk. JLine is a, um, well, it's a lifetime of pain. Okay. <coughs> so. How many of you guys are familiar with parser combinators, or unfamiliar with parser combinators? Anyone unfamiliar? Okay, so we'll do, I ha, uh, you get about maybe 60 seconds of a parser combinator explanation, okay? Parser combinators are, I have a parser that parses something, I call it foo, and then I want to parse the string bar after foo is done parsing. So I put this little funny tilde operator because I love operators, and I really want more of them. Um, <laughs> So I put a little tilde operator that says parse foo and then parse bar and then parse a space and then parse a file that the person will type in, okay? And this creates a new, parse, a new parser which will parse foo, then the string bar, then a space, and then whatever file someone types in, okay? These are reusable parsers. I can define a file parser once and reuse it in a whole bunch of different code and I combine my parsers with these combinators. They are operators which allow you to combine things, okay? So tilde means then. Parse this, then parse that, then parse this. There's another one with it's a pipe called or, like parse this or parse this. Um, another interesting one, 
is uh, the, the three, I don't even know what you would call this, man. This is like, this is a mutant cat operator. Um, <laughs> what this does is we parse foo, and parsers by default return the string that they've parsed, okay? I don't want to return strings. I want to turn a string into my AST, my syntax tree, or my ADT, if, if, if I were Runar, right? So the ADT is I'm going to return an instance of foo after foo parses, okay? So I say, after you parse, this is the object you return. There's another version, which is the regular, for in the Scala parser library, it's the regular cat operator, but in SBT's library, it's just map. So after you parse I an ID, I want to run a map operation and convert the string which you parsed into an actual object called foo that has the ID in it, okay? So this is essentially, we've parsed strings and we're converting them into actual case classes and objects and that sort of thing, okay? So <coughs> the goal is when, we, when an ID is parsed, we want to return a foo, okay? Anyway. What we add on top of normal parser combinator libraries are things called examples. So if I have something that parses a possible language that someone can enter, I give them examples that they can autocomplete of most likely what they would be writing on the terminal. Okay? These are the most likely languages in order of how often I've seen them written on my own terminal. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, when the user hits tab, what the framework will do is it'll look at your parsers, look at these examples, combine them together, and provide them to the user so it helps with completion. You get that really nice autocomplete. Um, another thing you can do is you can define a parser as a token, which says this whole thing completes as one entity. Um, the, uh, you'll care about the details of that if you have time to work in the library, but we don't have a whole ton of time. Um, anyway, so here's, here's what the command line parser actually looks like if you want to make use of this. You need to use the SPT completion library. Um, you import SPT completion. You import the default parsers. You construct your command hierarchy. Okay, we have a command hierarchy of just do stuff. That's the only thing. Oh, and I was evil. This case class doesn't take parameters, but it should. Sorry. Um, ignore that. Pretend there's parameters here. Never do this. All right, and the next thing is we define a do stuff parser, which is going to parse the token do and return the do stuff command. Okay? And then I'm going to create my command parser, which can parse any command, and right now it just parses the do stuff <laughs> command. If I pass a string to this parser and I pass do, it will return me the do stuff command. If I pass any other string, it just fails. Okay? So now I can start parsing user input. Where this gets interesting is, I want to talk to the terminal and allow the user to press tab and get all that nice auto-completion. So what I do is I create what's called a full reader. Um, we, can, we can ask Mark why it's called a full reader. I don't even know. Uh, the full reader, you pass it um, a, a file of where to save a user's command history. So if you'd like them to be able to scroll through previous commands they've typed in the past, you can do so if you're implementing a REPL as a, as a terminal utility. If not, you just pass it the parser. And what this guy does is when you call readline, he will allow the user to press tab, to press up and down, and all the fancy things that you want from a command line application uh, and get auto-completion based on the, pro on the parser you've given it, okay? You can also give it a mask. A mask is, um, if you're like me, you just ask for someone's password and let them type it in the clear. But if you actually cared, you'd kind of hide it. Wherever they type a, a piece of input, you'd want to show a, a carrot or a star or a cat picture, I don't know, um, just to let them know that they type something, but you don't display it. So mask is a character which you will render every time they type in something. So you can hide things like passwords. All right? Now, uh, what's interesting is you can construct one of these readers that can read lines. Uh, based on a parser, and that's where you get your auto-completion information. After you parse a line from that reader, or after you get a line, you still have to parse it, because a user can just ignore all the auto-completion help and type whatever the heck they want. So then we parse the line, and we either get a right, here's the thing that we parsed, or a left, some sort of exception, parse exception, where there was an error. Um, we when we make these UIs for ourselves, we don't care about errors. We just assume we type everything perfectly because, you know, that's, that's what I think of myself. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we return the command. So uh, this is the example of reading passwords where you can pass in a star to read passwords. If you want to like read user input that, that you don't want them to see and you don't really care about this whole parsing crap, there's a thing called simple reader that comes with the library. So you can read in a password with the same mask and, and get everything. Um, and then now we're gonna talk about deployment. So I created this awesome command line tool. I have a main method. It does everything I want. It takes in user input. It has, it's a little terminal thing where they can type and all that. I need to deploy it. So for this snark guy in our build.sbt, we create a new project called native. We depend on the native packager, the SBT native packager. And these are the settings we add, these four. Name, maintainer, package summary, package description. We tell it what the main class is. We enable Java app packaging. And then we type Debian package bin. We get a Debian file. We install it on our system. If we are on my laptop, you'd see I'm just typing snark something. And then it does that work. If you say snark check, it shows your Twitter timeline. If you say snark uh, mentions, it shows you who mentioned you. And you can snark tweet to send tweets. Um, anyway, there, that's one option is this native packager where you use this SBT configuration. You can make a Debian file. You can make an RPM file. You can just make a zip file. But it's a way of distributing this to other people if you find it useful. Or if you're doing ops and you want to install this on like your EC2 boxes as a little command line helper to debug things. Um, the other option is there's a thing called conscript. Um, you literally create a uh, launch config file. This file is composed of uh, four sections. The one section is always copy and pasted from the SPT launch config. Um, the top is <laughs> what version does Scala use? We say just auto detect. The second one is your coordinates in a Maven repository. The third one are what Maven and Ivy repositories you need to resolve. You take this file, you put it in your GitHub repo, and then you say, you know, conscript install jsoret, whatever the name of your repo is, unless it's not jsoret, it's your name, your GitHub name, your GitHub repo, and you get a local install of your utility, assuming you have it published to a Maven repo somewhere, and this can resolve it. I just said that really, really quickly, but these are basically install options, right? You, you create this, you shove it out there, and all of a sudden, everyone can get access to your little utility if it's convenient and useful. Um, to recap, because I can't show you, there is a, uh, let's see. I don't, I don't remember how to get multiple windows in Mac. That's awesome. Uh, to recap, we have GitHub, Command tab. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I want Command-T. Anyway, I'm running out of time. Running out of time. There we go. OK, so GitHub, uh, and I don't have Wi-Fi on, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> GitHub.com slash jsoret slash snark. You can download this sucker. You can try it out. Um, it's, it's loaded up to Bintray. You can, you can package it locally. Um, what, it, what it does is when you start this guy, it's going to ask you to go to Twitter and authorize the app. And then you get a PIN number. You enter the PIN number with little stars on the command line. And it saves your, your uh, OAuth credentials somewhere. And it won't ask you again. And then you can check your tweets from the command line, which is a really great way to waste time at work. Um, and it saves you so much time versus going to the website. You know, Like, why even, why even open up a web browser when I can just like run a build and then check Twitter and then run a build? So. Uh, it really, really improved my throughput. Um, yeah, so with that, we have about a minute for, <laughs> for questions. I'm sorry I can't demonstrate this, because that's kind of a good point. We have, we have three questions. I think this one was first. Yeah, the evil secrets file should be very apparent what you need to do. You need to go to Twitter. You need to get your own developer API key, uh, which people will authorize you to do things on behalf of their account. And you need to create the evil secrets object and then shove your evil secrets in there. But I'm not giving you mine because uh, I don't want to get in trouble for what you might do to other people's accounts. Um, it's, it's one of these things where if, if you're given a secret, I don't like to give it out. But that's why, that's why it won't compile. Um, I'm debating just giving my secrets away anyway because I don't really care. I know enough people at Twitter. They know I'm not evil. So anyway, yeah. Uh, you, you need to create a, basically an evil secrets object and put your Twitter API docs, your, your app. So when it asks to authorize to make tweets on your behalf, it's going to do that whole auth crap. Yeah? Feature request. 
Yes. It should tweet the compile error to 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tweeting compile errors to 140 characters. I like that idea. Yeah, and, auto, and, then, and then there should be a bot that takes that and automatically opens a gyro ticket. <laughs> yes? So in the conscript uh, configuration file, you had a version of the detect, but then still in the name, uh, you had to append the actual still version. Yeah, this is, this is a, an artifact of, okay, so the way, the way the launcher works, it actually creates a nested class loader to share. You can launch more than one application, and it creates a nested class loader to share between applications with the Scala version embedded. I think I'm done. So I got to cut it off. Not going over. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.